Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you've all had a good week. Today's case, oh my God, it's going to be an infuriating one. This person makes my blood boil. So today we're going to be covering the case of Todd Kohlhepp. So Todd Kohlhepp was a serial killer, but he wasn't just like your typical serial killer. He is a modern day serial killer, which you don't really hear about that many serial killers anymore, thank God. God, but he committed some truly horrific acts. 13 years of pain for many families, sleepless nights for detectives, and general confusion for the people of Spartanburg County, all answered in a matter of days when a woman was found chained alive. The man at the middle of it all, Todd Colehead. But this man, he really is the worst. He is a narcissist. He is arrogant. He manipulated his way through life. I was born in day building. I cleared in under 30 seconds. Well, no, I cleared that under 30 seconds. I'm sorry, but you guys would be proud. But what is possibly the most infamous thing about this case is the Amazon reviews that Todd would leave. Todd would go on Amazon and buy things to prepare for his crimes. But what is so chilling is that after he would buy these products, he would leave a review on Amazon and he would be pretty open about what he was planning to do. And that is just really chilling that a person can leave reviews on Amazon and basically tell the world that he was going to become a murderer and no one did anything about it. So that is what we're going to get into today. And there is a lot more to this case than I originally anticipated because this case is pretty well known. So I kind of knew what to expect when I started researching, but I just felt like I was uncovering so much stuff. This case literally felt like an onion to me and I just kept peeling away the layers and there was just so much more to it. So we're possibly going to be here for a while and I'm just gonna warn you now, Sassy Danielle will make an appearance probably throughout this video. So let's jump in. So I just wanna give a huge thank you to today's sponsor and that is Magellan TV. Magellan TV is a documentary streaming service that has the largest collection of true crime shows anywhere. So if you are a true crime fan, which I am assuming all of you are, then Magellan TV is a hidden treasure. Magellan TV also like to focus on the complexities of real life. So whether that is the nature of the criminal mind, the lives of serial killers, or famous unsolved cases, they really do cover it all. And one documentary that is new to the service that you might actually be familiar with the case because we have covered it on this channel. And the documentary is called Murdered on Honeymoon, which covers the case of Annie Dewani. So just in case you don't remember, Annie Dewani was on her honeymoon and it should have been the happiest time of her life. But this was also when she was tragically murdered on her honeymoon. And the news of this murder sent shockwaves across the world. And that is what this documentary focuses on. And even if you have watched my video on Annie Dewani, even if you feel like you already know the case, the documentary Murdered on Honeymoon contains so much interview footage, especially with people connected to the case like Annie's family. And just seeing Annie's family actually talk about what happened and how it affected them is just so much more impactful. There are also still to this day lots of unanswered questions about the murder of Annie Dewani. So whenever I see a documentary on the case, I always watch it because I always want to see if I can learn a little bit more about what exactly happened. So definitely go check out the documentary Murdered on Honeymoon, but there is so many other documentaries on Magellan TV, not just true crime. They have documentaries from every single genre you can think of. Magellan TV is completely ad-free. 4K is always included in your subscription and they add over 20 hours of new content to their service every single week. And right now, Magellan TV are also offering gift cards for the holiday season. So if you have someone in your life that is true crime obsessed or maybe just documentary obsessed, then that is definitely something that you should check out. But best of all, Magellan TV are offering every single one of you a free one month trial. And if you guys wanted to take advantage of that incredible offer, go to the link in my description box, which is try.magellantv.com forward slash Danielle Kirsty. Thank you again to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video and making this video possible. But thank you to every single one of you watching right now, because truly without all of you guys, I wouldn't get opportunities like this. And now let's jump into today's case. Todd Colehep was born on the 7th of March, 1971, making him a Pisces. Now he was born in Fort 
Lauderdale. La Lauderdale, is that how you pronounce it? I never know how to pronounce so many things in my accent. So he was born in Fort Lauderdale in Florida, but he also did spend a lot of time in Georgia and South Carolina. And South Carolina is probably the main location where today's case takes place. Todd's parents were a couple called William and Regina, but they divorced when he was two years old. And from this moment going forward, Todd wouldn't really have much contact with his dad. Instead, Todd would grow up with his mom and his stepdad, who was a man called Carl Kolhep. And obviously Todd took his stepdad's name because obviously he's called Todd Kolhep. His stepdad also had two children from a prior relationship. So Todd is now living in a household with a family of five. Now growing up, Todd was described as a nightmare child. When Todd was just a toddler, his mom didn't know how to handle him. He wasn't just going through like the terrible twos, which you hear about a lot. Even from a young age, he was showing signs of serious aggression. It's also said that the older Todd got, he didn't want anything to do with other children. It's like he didn't like other children. He didn't want to socialize. He didn't make any friends at school. He just didn't like people. And the only way that he knew how to interact with other children in his school is through violence and anger. The level of violence that Todd was displaying from such a young age is so rare. I don't even want to call him a bully because he is a bully, don't get me wrong, but bully doesn't even feel like a strong enough word for what Todd was. So when he was at school, he would just push the other children around. He would say horrible things to them. He would be destructive in the classrooms. He would even get the school projects of other children and destroy them. And I know that that does sound like a bully. It does, doesn't it? But there was this one incident that was very, very extreme. So Todd was on the school bus. He was sat next to a girl and we don't really know what happened, but for some reason, this girl made Todd really Really, really mad. And in retaliation, Todd pulled out a pair of scissors and stabbed the girl in the leg. And that is what I mean. That is not normal bully behavior. That just goes far beyond like a normal typical bully. And he wasn't just a nightmare at home and school. He was also a nightmare in the neighborhood. He would just go around looking to pick fights with the other children in the neighborhood. The other children were really terrified of him. Pretty much everyone was terrified of him and he's a child. He would go around trying to pick fights with anyone over the smallest thing, he would shout insults at everyone that he saw. There were even times where people witnessed Todd get other children and repeatedly bang their head off of clay pipes. There was another time where Todd put another child in like a dog crate cage thing and he just rolled that crate down a hill. And this poor child was crying and screaming. They were in this cage being thrown around that was being rolled down a hill. And Todd was just laughing the whole time. He got enjoyment from inflicting pain on others. In his childhood, there are also incidences of animal abuse, which, oh God, it's like, can it really get any worse? Can you believe he's still a child at this point? If you don't want to hear this, maybe just skip forward a minute. So there was a time where he got a BB gun and he shot it at a neighbor's dog. And then there was another time where Todd killed his own pet goldfish. So there was this huge thing where Todd was throwing a tantrum saying that he didn't want a goldfish anymore. He actually wanted a gerbil. And his mom was like, no, you've already got one pet. Like I'm not getting you another one. So Todd was like, oh, okay. So seeing as I can't have two pets at one time, I'm going to kill my current one. So Todd poured bleach into the goldfish bowl and watched his goldfish die. Todd's mom and stepdad just didn't know what to do with him. It even got so bad that by the time he was nine years old, and just let that sink in, everything that we've said so far is before the age of nine. So things got so bad that by the time Todd was nine years old, he was sent to a child behavioral institute in Georgia. And he was there for approximately three and a half months where he was being treated for his anger. And that is such a significant step to send a child of nine years old to an institution like that. Can you believe that it's that bad when he is nine? Just imagine what he's like when he's an adult. Now you're probably thinking, what the hell happened in Todd's life to make him like this? What is making him so angry? And I wish I could give you a definitive answer, but I can't. However, there are a couple of things that possibly could explain 
where Todd's anger comes from. So the first possible reason is that Todd himself has said that he never really felt like he fitted in with his family. He always felt like he came second to his step siblings. He would argue with his stepdad constantly. He always just felt like he was the outsider of the family. But then secondly, it's said that Todd was mollycoddled by his mom. And this is probably an understatement. So Todd was mommy's little golden boy. He could do no wrong. Todd's mom never punished him for anything. He was never held accountable for anything that he did. She was always just making excuses for him. Oh, it's because of this why he's so violent. Oh, it's because of this why he killed his goldfish. It's not Todd's fault. Now, this last possible explanation is that Todd has claimed that he received a lot of abuse from his granddad. Now, I just wanna make it very clear before I move on that these allegations are only coming from Todd. We don't know if they're true. So Todd was out of control, as we all know. And because Todd's mother didn't really know how to deal with him and how to handle him, she would quite often send Todd to stay with his granddad. Now, his granddad was a very strict person and she kind of thought that he would help Todd get on the straight and narrow. But whilst Todd was in the care of his granddad, he did not have a good time whatsoever. It's said that if Todd ever stepped out of line, the punishments that he would receive from his granddad were severe. One example would be that Todd's granddad would drag him outside by the hair, tie him to a tree and beat him with a leather belt or a horse whip. There would be other times as well where his granddad would shock him with an electrical cattle prod just for the fun of it. There was another time as well where his granddad castrated a pig in front of him and he told Todd that if he ever stepped out of line, he would do that to Todd. So that is pretty much Todd's childhood. And then when he turns 12, his biological dad returns. So remember, Todd hasn't seen his biological dad since the age of two. And Todd's biological dad just didn't want anything to do with Todd for his whole life. He didn't really make any kind of attempt to get in contact with Todd until this moment. Now, Todd's dad was the kind of person that put himself first. He was also a very angry and violent man. And he pretty much spent his whole whole life chasing women. He had no interest in Todd whatsoever, even for those first two years where he was in his life, he didn't care. He even went on a date with another woman the night that Todd was born. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the kind of person that Todd's dad is. So as Todd is literally just about to enter his teenage years because he's 12, his biological dad just shows up out of the blue. He basically went up to Todd and was just like, hey, do you want to be a father and son again? Like, do you want that relationship? Now, Todd's mom was understandably very hesitant about this. She knew the kind of man that Todd's father was and she didn't really want that around her son. But Todd really wanted a relationship with his dad. Todd actually didn't hold it against his dad that his dad just disappeared and was absent in his life. Todd had built up this this fantasy of what his dad was. Todd also started to think about how much better his life would be if he went to live with his biological dad. So he started demanding that his mom let him go and live with him. Now his mom did everything that she could to try and stop him. Todd's mom even redid his bedroom to try and entice him to stay at home. But Todd just picked up a hammer and destroyed his new bedroom furniture. Todd was just getting more and more out of hand and Todd's mom was actually kind of scared of him and scared of what he could do. Todd also started threatening to kill his mom if she didn't let him go and live with his dad. And Todd's mom was genuinely scared of Todd that she actually had to put a lock on her bedroom when she went to sleep. And in the end, because Todd just couldn't get his own way, he started threatening that he would take his own life if his mom wouldn't let him go. And this basically forced his mom into letting him go. She felt like she had no other option. So at the age of 12, Todd moves to Arizona to live with his dad. So Todd was now living with his dad and he had been dreaming about this moment for a long time. He had built up this fantasy of his dad and what his life would be like living with him. But fantasy is not reality. Pretty quickly, Todd became fed up of living with his dad because it turns out that 
Todd's dad wasn't really interested in Todd. Like I said, he was more interested in himself. And if Todd ever stepped out of line, his dad would give him a beating. So Todd was stuck in Arizona now with his dad and he wanted to go home. He wanted to go back and live with his mom, but his mom refused to have him back. She had realized that the house was so much more peaceful without Todd. Everyone was getting on. It was just such a nicer environment for everyone to live in. And she didn't want him to come back. So Todd felt completely abandoned. But there was one thing that Todd and his dad did bond over and that was weapons. Now Todd's dad as well was a little bit of a liar. <laughs> I say a little bit, a lot of a liar. He would tell his son that he was a mercenary and he was trained to kill. Now Todd being young and impressionable and he idolized his dad, he believed him. And obviously these stories were fake, but Todd believed them and they had a huge impact on him. Todd thought that his dad was this like military man, that he was this bounty hunter kind of person that would go around killing people. And this impressed Todd. He was like, wow, my dad is so cool. So this is essentially all that Todd and his dad bonded over, the fact that he was this ex-mercenary, even though he wasn't, and their love for weapons, Todd's dad even taught him how to make homemade bombs. And Todd himself at a later date has said that when he was living with his biological father, he could literally feel the violence inside of him growing. And there were some very violent incidences when Todd was living at his dad's house. But according to Todd, when he was 14 years old, still living with his dad, he got into a fight with a local gang member. So Todd then followed him to his car and pulled out a gun and and shot at him through the window. Now, there is no way to know if this is true or not. Todd doesn't even know the identity of the person that he apparently shot. He also doesn't even know if he actually shot the person because he literally just fired the gun and ran away. But I think this is just another example of how violent Todd is at such a young age that he is carrying a gun on him for starters and he's only 14 years old and he will just pull out a gun after a small fight and shoot someone. But regardless of whether that incident is true or not, we are about to talk about an incident that we 100% know is true. And I do need to give a warning here, we are going to be talking about sexual assault. So this happened in 1986 when Todd was only 15 years old. So Todd had started to become infatuated with a neighbor and he was completely obsessed with this girl. He wanted this girl to be his girlfriend. On multiple occasions, Todd had approached this girl, asked her on a date, invited her over to his house, but each time the girl declined. But it is very important to note here that Todd doesn't take too kindly to rejection. He doesn't even know what the word no means. And he lashed out in the most horrific way. On the 25th of November, 1986, Todd's dad was away on vacation. So Todd had the whole house to himself. Todd went into his father's bedroom and he picked up a 22 caliber handgun. He then went over to the neighbor's house, the house that belonged to the girl that he was infatuated with. Todd lured her out of her house on false pretenses. And as soon as she stepped foot out of her house, he pulled out the gun and held it at her head. He then forced this girl to walk with him back to his house. And then tragically, once Todd had this girl back at his home, he forced her into his bedroom. He tied her up with rope. He placed duct tape over her mouth. And then he proceeded to rape her. Back at the girl's house, her younger brother, who was only five years old, noticed that his older sister was missing and he dialed 911. Todd started to hear sirens approaching in the distance and he started to panic. Todd had to make a decision. Should he let this girl live or should he murder her? The girl manages to convince Todd to not murder her. She tells Todd, I won't tell anyone. I won't tell anyone. Just let me go. And Todd told her that he would let her go. But if she ever told anyone, he would murder her younger siblings. So Todd then walked the girl home. She is absolutely traumatized by what has happened to her and she is debating, should she tell someone? So the police do arrive not too long after and the police are questioning her. They're saying, 
what is going on? Where did you go? And she just broke down and she came clean about everything that had happened to her. The police then rush to Todd's home where they find Todd sitting on the floor and he is holding a rifle. And Todd just turns to the police and says, how much time am I going to get for this? He drops the weapon and is immediately arrested and taken down to the station. But this poor girl, it had a devastating effect on her life. Her grades fell, she dropped out of school. Todd had ruined her life, at least he tried to. I hope that she's doing okay now. All for what? Because she turned him down. And this incident just shows how violent Todd will be, but just the extreme lengths that he will go to. He is only 15, but the way he methodically went about this assault is chilling. The fact that he planned this all out, the fact that he lured her out with this false story, the fact that he used rope and duct tape, and then the fact that he walked her home. I just cannot get over that. Like he was walking her home from a date or something. So following his arrest, Todd is charged with kidnapping, sexual assault, and committing a dangerous crime against a child. And when he was asked, why did he do this? He said that he was acting out of anger and rebellion towards his dad. Todd was also diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. A psychiatrist also wrote that Todd was displaying signs of ego inflation and that the only emotion he was capable of was anger. Also later down the line, profilers have categorized Todd as having a narcissistic personality. And oh boy, that is an understatement. Todd is literally a true narcissist. Following this analysis, the prosecution decided to throw everything at Todd. They saw him as a danger to society. They wanted to charge Todd as an adult, not a child. And obviously you've got to remember that he's only 15, so he's technically a child. But in the end, he was charged as an adult and he was sentenced to 15 years in prison. He was also registered as a sex offender. And when Todd's sentence was read out, Todd's mom was outraged. She was saying things like, I have never seen this happen to a 15 year old child before. And then I feel like I just need to pause for a second because the next thing that she says, oh, she said, quote, they don't even stop to think that he even walked the girl home. Does that sound like a dangerous criminal? He even walked the girl home. <laughs> oh my God. He has just raped someone. <laughs> And you think the fact that he walked her home negates that. I feel like this literally portrays his mom. Like I said earlier on in the video, he is never held accountable for what he has done. His mom always makes excuses for him. So then following this sentence, Todd would spend the next 15 years in prison. And he actually did spend 15 years in prison. He didn't get a reduced sentence for good behavior or anything like that. And he actually was pretty well behaved in prison. There were a few altercations in the first few years that he was in prison. But after that, he was a model prisoner. So it's now August 2001 and Todd has just been released from prison after spending 15 years in prison. So he is now 30 years old. And this this is a huge adjustment for him because he obviously went into prison when he was 15. Now he's 30. So after his release, he moved to Spartanburg, South Carolina. This was where his mom was currently living, which is why he moved there because he literally didn't have anyone else on the outside. He only had his mom and his mom had stuck by him the whole time he was in prison. Todd did manage to get his own place eventually, but he did really struggle because he couldn't shake the reputation that he was a sex offender because obviously he's on the sex offenders register. His name is out there publicly. And no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't get away from it. But another thing that he really struggled with now that he was out of prison was his relationship with women. After being in prison for so long, he had no experience dating women. He didn't know how to interact with them. And because of this, he was incredibly isolated. He was incredibly lonely, but he was also very, very angry. I mean, he was already an angry person before he went into prison. Prison hadn't rehabilitated him in any way. And now he's possibly even more angry than he was before. So it is now 2003. And this is approximately two years after he has been released from prison. And Todd thinks to himself, 
I want a motorbike. Now this was a very like out of the blue decision. Todd had never ridden a motorbike before in his life, but it was something that he wanted to do. And Todd didn't want a bike that was possibly better suited for him being a beginner. Oh no, Todd wanted a very big bike. He wanted a powerful bike. He basically wanted a bike that was going to feed his ego. So one day in April of 2003, Todd makes his way to Superbike Motorsports in Chesney, South Carolina. Carolina. And he purchases, I've got to look down, otherwise I'm going to get this wrong. He purchases a Suzuki GSX R750 for $9,000. Now I don't know anything about motorbikes, but from a quick Google search, this is a pretty powerful bike. Definitely not a bike for beginners. But Todd, he was like, oh no, I can handle this bike. But could he handle this bike? Absolutely not. So Todd went back to the store, Superbike Motorsports, with his tail between his legs. And he asked the staff at the store if he could exchange the bike for something more suitable. Now, apparently, and I say apparently because we don't know, this is just Todd's word, the staff at the store absolutely ridiculed him. They poked fun at the fact that he thought that he could ride this big bike and he was only a beginner. They told him that he should have bought something more sensible in the first place and they weren't going to exchange the bike. So then Todd returns home and three days after he went to the store, apparently his motorbike was stolen. And then for some reason, Todd became convinced that the staff at the store had stolen the bike. And I don't know how he got to that conclusion. It's like, why would the staff go and steal the bike? Like, why would they do that? But for some reason, Todd came fixated on this and was completely convinced that the employees had stolen the bike and he wanted revenge. So in November of 2003, and this is like over six months after apparently the motorbike had been stolen. So this is definitely a significant period of time that Todd is formulating his plan. So in early November, 2003, Todd makes another visit to Superbike Motorsports. Now currently in the store when Todd visits are four staff members, owner of the store, Scott Ponder, his mother and bookkeeper, Beverly Guy, service manager Brian Lucas, and mechanic Chris Sherbert. So Todd goes into the store. Now there are other customers currently in the store, so Todd starts to just look around the store, show some interest in some bikes. He waits until all of the other customers have left the store. Now what exactly happens next is not completely clear because we only have Todd to go by, but he tells a staff member that he's interested in a particular bike. He wants to buy this bike. So Chris Sherbert takes the bike, he's the mechanic, he takes the bike into the back to stop prepping it for the sale. This is when Todd pulls out a pair of latex gloves before pulling out a handgun. He makes his way to the back of the store first where Chris is currently prepping the bike. He tragically fired two shots at Chris in quick succession, killing him instantly. The other three staff members hear the gunshots and start making their way to the back of the store. This is when Todd leaves the back of the store and the first person he comes across is Beverly Guy. He then points his gun at 52 year old Beverly Guy before firing two to three shots in her chest where she immediately fell to the ground. The other two staff members are now alerted to what is going on because initially they didn't quite know what was going on. They didn't actually know that there was a person firing a gun in the store. So Scott and Brian turned to run for the door, but sadly it was too late. Todd started firing at both of them. Todd fired multiple rounds at Scott and Brian before hitting them both in their backs where they collapsed before dying from their injuries. Todd then went round to each victim, firing one more shot into their heads. He has now taken the lives of four innocent people. And he did this in a matter of minutes. And later on down the line, he would actually brag about how quickly he did all of this. And he just walked out of that store and went home. Todd has only recently just gotten out of prison on a rape charge and now he's committed mass murder. And apparently this was all over a disagreement over the fact that they poked fun at his purchase of a motorbike. And I don't believe for one second that the employees of that store were rude to him. I really don't. Because you have to remember who Todd is and the kind of personality that he is. He thinks that he's above everyone. He has a very, very inflated ego. And just because they wouldn't 
exchange the bike for what he wanted because he couldn't get what he wanted, this is how he retaliated. So following these horrific murders, a friend of one of the employers of the store paid a visit to the store and they came across this absolutely horrific scene. When detectives arrived at the scene, they could not figure out who had done this. There was absolutely no evidence left behind, no DNA evidence, nothing. The only thing that detectives could figure out is that this attack was personal. It wasn't a robbery gone wrong because nothing from the store had been taken. There was actually a briefcase in the store that contained $10,000 and that was still in the store. I honestly cannot believe that this happened, but a year after the shootings, the police still didn't have a clue who had done this. But the police actually blamed the mass shooting on one of the victim's wives. And they got a tip from a member of the public that the owner, Scott Ponder, couldn't have children. And the police, when they heard this, they thought, hmm, that's strange because Scott does have a child. Him and his wife, they have a child together. So the police take a DNA sample from Scott's child and they test the DNA from the child to see if it matches the owner, Scott Ponder. And they find out that it doesn't match. The DNA of the child actually matches another employee that was at the store that was also murdered. The child's DNA actually matches the man manager Brian Lucas. So the police immediately accuse Scott's wife of having an affair with Brian and that is who she actually had a child with. They also blamed her for the mass shooting. They blamed her. They said that she did it because this was a love triangle gone wrong. But the wife was innocent. <laughs> she was completely innocent. She hadn't done the shooting and she hadn't had an affair. What actually happened is the police had mixed up the blood vials of Brian and Scott and gotten them mixed up, mislabeled them. So the child's DNA actually did match Scott's. But can you believe that the police blamed his wife? I mean, she has just lost her husband. She was actually pregnant at the time of the mass shooting, which adds another level of heartbreak to that case that Scott never actually got to meet his child. So she had to go through her pregnancy without her husband. She gave birth. She is now raising a child on her own. And now the police are knocking at her door, blaming her for the shooting, accusing her of having an affair. That is absolutely disgusting. And because the police wasted so much time trying to chase Scott's wife, trying to blame her for this, so much time had passed that Todd completely slipped through the net, even though they possibly could have caught him because he was on the customer records for buying that bike earlier on in April. And if the police had just gone through the customer records, maybe they would have found the registered sex offender. So Todd has now gotten away with murder and this would go unsold for the next 13 years. And Todd was riding high off the back of these murders. It's almost like it gave him motivation to move to the next stage of his life. He was ready to turn his life around because prior to these murders, he was really isolated, really lonely, really struggling. Well, not anymore. Following these murders, he actually went on to study for a degree in business administration and marketing. And then in 2006, he makes the steps in fulfilling a dream of his, which is owning his own real estate business. And this just really, really, really infuriates me, is to open his own real estate business, he had to apply for a license. And as part of that application, they found out that he had a criminal record. They found out that he was on the sex offenders register. So Todd had to explain why he had a conviction conviction for rape. It's like, I'm sorry, he's raped someone. Why are we giving him the chance to explain? But he was asked to explain the situation. But did Todd tell the truth? Oh no, of course he didn't. He actually said that it was a complete misunderstanding. According to Todd, he had had a heated argument with his girlfriend and the girl's parents were really concerned and worried for their daughter. So they called the police and it was actually just a complete misunderstanding. Nothing happened and no one looked into it any further. They bought his lies. And Todd's application for a real estate license was approved. I am sorry, this reeks of privilege. So he starts his own business, which he calls Todd Colehep and Associates 
real estate. And it grows quickly. He's very successful. He actually ends up hiring about a dozen employees and things are really going great for him. He's earning a lot of money. He's able to purchase a really nice home for himself. He even fulfills another childhood dream of his, which is getting a pilot's license. It's like, does karma exist for this man? Really? But was Todd a nice person to work for? No. Of course he wasn't, especially for the women that worked for him. I mean, it started off and he was a really great person to work for, but that soon faded away. He has been described as rude, belligerent, condescending, and he would be really inappropriate to the women that worked for him. He would objectify the women that worked for him. He would make very inappropriate comments. He would also bully and belittle the staff if they annoyed him or if they didn't do what he wanted, which is very reminiscent of what he was like as a child. He even started bragging about his prior sexual assaults to his colleagues. It's just like, how is he getting away with this? He's being very open about who he is. Todd just in general just liked talking about himself. That was his favorite topic. He liked bragging about how much money he was earning, that he had the pilot's license, that he had all of these guns. Like he literally had hundreds of guns that he was purchasing illegally. I just want to point that out. And at this point in his life, I really don't know how, but he has multiple relationships. I don't know how. It's like, really? How? He managed to have multiple relationships at the same time. So that is pretty much what Todd's life was like after the mass shooting and his life was like this for approximately 10 years. And can you believe that Todd is a serial killer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're about to get onto that now. So now we get to 2014. Todd is now in his 40s and he's just completely fed up at this point. He's fed up that he doesn't have a serious relationship, that things are not good with his family. And I think he started to realize that people don't really like him. His behavior completely changed at work. He became very isolated, distant, cold. And this is where things start to take a very dark turn, even darker than it was before, because I feel like we need to remember that this man has already committed mass murder. I can't say for certain that Todd thought to himself, I'm going to become a serial killer. But he was definitely having some very dark thoughts because it's now that he starts to make very disturbing plans. And ultimately these plans would lead him to become a serial killer. So first of all, Todd buys this huge piece of land and it's huge, it's 100 acres and it's pretty isolated. It's in the middle of the woods. It's off this really quiet road. And of course you guys know that I like to go on Google maps and you can't drop the little man outside of the house because it is so isolated but you can zoom in on it you can see the odd house here and there but because he is on a hundred acres of land he pretty much has no neighbors and the first thing that todd decides to do is to turn this land into a fortress. He installs cameras. He spends $80,000 installing a chain link fence around his whole property. And then he also places this huge shipping container on his land. And it's like, why does the average person need a shipping container? So now he moves on to the next stage of his plan and he pretty much decides to stockpile everything. And I literally mean everything. Todd actually thought that the end of the world was coming. He started stockpiling food and weapons and just like survival gear. I feel like this is a good time to point out that Todd's favorite TV show was The Walking Dead and his favorite character was Negan. He actually posted one time on Facebook that he thought Negan should be president. I feel like that really just sums up Todd, doesn't it? So then once he had everything for the end of the world stockpiled, he decided to make a few more purchases on Amazon. And now we get to the point in the case where we go through his chilling Amazon reviews. Todd's username as well on Amazon was me. M-E, me. He really does think that the world revolves around him. So he bought a small knife and then he left the review and wrote, quote, haven't stabbed anyone yet. Mm -hmm. And I will emphasize the word yet, but I am keeping the dream alive. And when I do, it will be with a quality tool like this. Let that sink in. Todd wrote that on Amazon 
for the world to see, for anyone to come across. I just feel like surely Amazon, like something in their software should have been able to flag this. This is 2014. We're not talking about back in the early 2000s or anything like that. This was not that long ago. There is the technology to be able to flag these comments, but that's not all. He also purchased a shovel where he wrote, quote, keep in the car for when you have to hide the bodies and leave the full size shovel at home. We are still not done. He purchased a small metal padlock and wrote, quote, works great. Also, if someone talks back, go old school on them by putting this in a sock and beating them. He also bought a chainsaw and he left the review, quote, works excellent. Getting the neighbor to stand still whilst you chase him with it is hard enough without having an easy chainsaw to use. And then possibly the most chilling of all, he purchased another padlock and left the review, quote, solid locks have five on a shipping container. Won't stop them, but will sure slow them down till they are too old to care. And um, if you already know this case, you know what he does with the shipping container. <sighs> God, it's just chilling. I just cannot get over it. And he left a total of 140 reviews. Obviously, I don't have the time to read all of them, but you actually can see most of them online if you did want to look at some more. But it's just crazy that Todd was having these dark and disturbing thoughts. And then he was literally telling the world. He wasn't hiding it. He was reviewing these products on Amazon. I just feel like something could have been done at this point. And if you were to see these reviews on Amazon, what would you think? I mean, after researching this case, I'm definitely going to think differently, but I think it's very easy to see something like that and possibly think, um, okay, that person clearly has very dark humor, but I don't feel like you would take them seriously. I, I don't know, but I will definitely think differently now if I'm reading reviews on Amazon or any other website. And if I see any kind of comments like this, I'm going to report them. So it's now 2015. He was definitely putting his plans into place for a while. And by this time, Todd had become a frequent visitor of a Waffle House restaurant. And whilst he was at this restaurant, he was the biggest creep. But what do we expect? He was very inappropriate to the women that worked there. He would make very rude, disgusting comments. And it's thought that at the Waffle House restaurant is where Todd met his first victim, not technically his first victim, but his first victim in um, him becoming a serial killer, who was 26 year old Megan Coxie. Megan and her 29 year old husband, Johnny Coxie, were a young couple. They had a young child as well. They were just trying to live their lives together, but they had currently fallen on hard times and were just trying to kind of put their lives back together. Both of them had recently been released from jail and they were struggling to find work. And one day, Todd, in an attempt to lure Megan to his property, he offered her work. He said that he needed some maintenance work done on his his property and Todd decided to offer both Megan and Johnny a job doing maintenance work on his fortress. Now, Megan and Johnny, they are really struggling for money, so they agree. On the 22nd of December, 2015, Megan and Johnny arrived at Todd's property, but as soon as they did, an altercation broke out. Now, the exact version of events is not known, but Todd would later claim that Johnny and Megan attempted to rob him. But what we do know is that at some point during this altercation, Todd pulled out a semi-automatic gun, pointed it at Johnny and shot him twice in the chest, killing him instantly. Megan, who had literally just witnessed her husband be murdered, tried to flee from the property. But Todd was not about to let this happen. He tackled her to the ground. He put handcuffs on her. He also shackled her legs. He then shot one more bullet into her husband in front of her. Following this, he then dragged Megan across his property and forced her into that large shipping container. He then locked her up using one of the padlocks that he bought from Amazon. He then left her there to go and bury Johnny's body on his property. And then from this moment forward, Todd would keep Megan captive for six 
days. Now the exact events of what happened in those six days are not known, but I don't feel like it takes a genius to figure out probably what was going on. Todd claims though that he was only holding Megan captive because he was worried that she would go to the police and report that he had just murdered her husband. I don't think he's wrong there, but I also don't think that that was the real reason why he was holding Megan captive. But what we do know, after holding Megan captive for six days, Todd just couldn't handle it anymore. Apparently, according to Todd, Megan was a difficult prisoner. She wasn't complying with what he wanted her to do. So tragically, it's thought on Christmas Day of 2015, Todd walked Megan outside of the shipping container and shot and killed her. He then buried her body next to her husband, Johnny. And this, what has just happened, is 12 years after the mass shooting at the superbike shop. He has now just taken two more lives, but I just cannot wrap my head around Todd because he has changed his MO so many times. He's gone from a rapist to a mass murderer, to now he's killed a couple and he also held the woman captive for nearly a week. Friends and family did report Megan and Johnny missing, but the police didn't really take them seriously. Because Megan and Johnny had just gotten out of jail and because they did move around a lot, the police didn't even believe that the couple were missing. But tragically, he is still not done because those two murders were not enough for him. In August of 2016, which is just eight months, after the murder of Megan and Johnny. Todd invites another couple to carry out work on his property. This couple was 30-year-old Kayla Brown and her 32-year-old boyfriend, Charlie Carver. Kayla and Charlie had been dating for approximately about a month at this point, but already, even though they had only been dating a month, they were really close. Charlie had a really good job and Kayla just did like the odd jobs around town and just things were going great for this couple. Now, Kayla actually knew Todd prior to this. She had carried out some work for him before on his property. And there are also Facebook messages between Kayla and Todd that possibly suggest that there could have been some sort of sexual relationship between the two in the past. So when Todd asked Kayla if she could carry out some work for him on his property, Kayla trusted him. She knew him. She thought, yeah, why not? She wanted to earn a little bit of extra money. Now, Kayla told her boyfriend, Charlie, about the work that she was supposed to do for Todd, that she needed to clean up the garden on his compound. Charlie offered to accompany her, but tragically, neither one of them knew exactly what Todd was planning. So on the 31st of August, 2016, Kayla and Charlie arrive at Todd's property. They make their way to the area that is just around the shipping container. When they get there, Todd is already waiting for them and he hands them both hedge clippers and starts telling them like, I need this done, I need that done, I need this cleared over here. And then at some point in the conversation, Todd says to the couple, oh, I just need to go into the shipping container and grab something. But when he comes back out of the shipping container, he is holding a gun. And just like before, Todd has later, accused the couple of trying to steal something from him. And before either Kayla or Charlie have any time to react, Todd raises the gun and shoots Charlie three times in the chest. Todd then turns to Kayla and tells her, unless you want to suffer the same fate, you will go into that shipping container. So Kayla complies and she goes into the shipping container. I mean, of course she does. She is absolutely terrified. She has just witnessed her boyfriend being murdered in cold blood in front of her. And once she is inside the shipping container, he does the same thing to Kayla that he did to Megan. Todd handcuffed her. He shackled her legs. He also put a ball gag in her mouth. He told her to wait there, wait there in the shipping container whilst he went and down with Charlie's body. He then buried Charlie's body next to Megan and Johnny. And then once Todd returned from burying Charlie's body, he placed a dog collar around Kayla's neck. He then used this dog collar to chain her to the wall of the shipping container. Todd now has his second prisoner. And I literally have no words. He has just committed his seventh murder. The conditions that Kayla was kept in were 
absolutely appalling. She remained in that shipping container. She was in the dark. It was damp. It was smelly. She had this metal dog collar around her neck pretty much the whole time. She was only ever allowed out of the shipping container to use the bathroom. She was given small amounts of food each day. Todd threatened to kill her if she ever even tried to escape. Todd would also tell Kayla that he was this prolific serial killer, that he had victims into the three digits. And obviously that is a lie, but he was just trying to intimidate Kayla and she has no reason to disbelieve him. Todd confesses to Kayla about the murders of Megan and Johnny. He also confesses about the mass murder at the bike shop. Todd also told Kayla that she was being kept there because eventually, she would fall in love with him, that she would start developing Stockholm Syndrome. And then every single day, twice a day, Kayla was made to do whatever Todd wanted sexually. And if she didn't comply, he would kill her entire family before then killing her. And this is what Kayla had to go through for 65 years days. For 65 days, she was kept in those conditions. She was being sexually assaulted multiple times a day. Kayla was resigned to her fate. She thought that she was going to die. But what Kayla didn't know is that there was a huge search party looking for her and looking for her boyfriend, Charlie. It was on the news all the time about this missing couple. Where were they? The police were involved. Everyone was looking for Kayla and Charlie. And Todd sees all of this media coverage. He sees people actively searching for the couple and he starts to panic. He starts to think, oh my God, I need to throw throw the police off. I need to send them in like the complete different direction. So he takes Charlie's phone, which he has kept, and he starts posting on Facebook pretending to be Charlie. He starts posting very vague, very cryptic things on Facebook, saying things like, oh, we're okay, like we're fine. He also said that Kayla and himself were running away together, that they had gone and got married. Now, Charlie's friends and family knew that something was off from these Facebook messages. Now, Charlie was a writer. So whenever he did post anything on social media, Everything was always spelt correctly. He always used proper grammar. But the things that Todd was posting on Facebook had spelling mistakes. Grammar was pretty much not used. And Charlie's friends and family were like, this is 100% not Charlie. So the search continued what Todd had done didn't work. The weeks searching for Kayla and Charlie turned into months until the police finally had a breakthrough. The police had managed to track down the location of Kayla's cell phone, which had pinged off a nearby tower to Todd's property. This was the last place that Kayla's cell phone was, so the police have a really strong suspicion that Kayla is there. They obtain a search warrant and they make their way to Todd's property. We now get to the 3rd of November, 2016, and the police arrive at Todd's compound. But Todd is not actually there. He's back at his house in Spartanburg, which he still owns. He kind of splits his time between his compound and his house. So the police send another search party to Todd's house whilst the other search party stays at the compound. So back at the compound, it's being searched. They first come across an outer building, which they search, which basically just contains the supplies for the end of the world. It also contains like machinery and just stuff like that. So nothing really that would suggest any criminal activity. They then move further onto the land and they find a storage unit, which again, they search, there's nothing in there. And then they come across a large shipping container that has five padlocks on it. Officers searching the land as well from the shipping container, they can hear a very faint sound. It almost sounds like someone is in there. And I am going to be inserting footage because the police that found her, they had body cams on, so this was able to be captured. And I am going to warn you all now, this footage is of Kayla, like finding her, she is in the footage. And this footage has been widely shared, which is why I am showing it in this video. The officers have power tools and they start breaking down the door of the storage unit. They manage to prize open the doors and inside, they find Kayla. What? Back up here. This one. Are you okay? Grab what? Go. Do you have any weapons? Coming through, okay? 
What's your name? What's your name, right here? Lauren. Lauren. Okay. All right. Just a girl. Just a girl. Just a girl. Just How are you, honey? This we're is bolt this cutters. Is, this is our best. Footers. He's a paramedic. Oh yeah. Okay. We're gonna get you out of there. Okay. Just hang loose for me. Anybody got? A, I need a handcuff key. They find her chained to the wall. They find her with the dog collar on. And they were asking Kayla, "Where's Charlie?" Because obviously they were looking for Charlie as well. And this is when Kayla broke the news to the police that Todd had shot Charlie. Do you know where your buddy is? Charlie. Yes. He shot him. He shot him. He shot Who him. did? Who? Todd Kohep shot Charlie Carver three times in the chest. Kayla as well, as the police were cutting through her handcuffs, Kayla was telling the police he's also killed two other people. They're also buried on the property. She tells the police he claims to be a serial killer, that he has over a hundred victims. Police are also at this point at Todd's house and they are interviewing Todd. They are saying, where's Kayla? Where's Charlie? And Todd wasn't exactly about to come clean about what he has done. He was just like, I don't know. I don't know. The couple did carry out some work for me, but I don't know where they are. I haven't seen them since that day. More details to you. Hey, you're um, scaring the hell out of me. No, this is the <laughs> These people have not been seen since they were at your property. Okay. Okay. I don't have an answer for it, sir. And this interview footage of Todd in his house, it really angers me. I don't know why, but Todd is just sat in this chair. He's not handcuffed at this point, And I just feel like he sat there so arrogantly. Eventually, the police that are interviewing Todd do get word from the police searching the compound that they have found Kayla. We have Kayla in your property. She was locked in a container. Okay. Okay, why'd you lock her in a container in your property? She's on your property right now, locked in a container. At this point, Todd is arrested and placed in handcuffs. Now we get to the interview of Todd at the police station, and there is so much footage of this interview. And I will be inserting some of the clips from the interview because you've got to see him. You've got to see how arrogant he is. So before the interview, Todd does make a phone call. And who does he call? Of course he calls his mommy. And of course he calls his mom because he wants his mom to tell him that everything is going to be okay. Don't worry, Todd, you won't get in trouble. And this phone call to his mom, it obviously was recorded and he confesses to his mom that he is a serial killer. And he said something to his mom that I literally cannot stop playing over and over in my head. Todd's mom asks him how many victims he has and Todd responds, too many to count on your hands. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of them. Ah. What the fuck? Uh, they don't have enough fingers. Meanwhile, back at Todd's compound, the bodies of Megan, Johnny, and Charlie are found. And the police realize that they now have a bigger case on their hands than they were originally expecting. So now we actually do get to the interview of Todd in the police station and be prepared to be infuriated. So one of the first things that Todd says to the police interviewing him was, I've got a few cases to close for you. I'm gonna close a few cases for you. He's gonna be up late tonight. All arrogantly, as if he's doing the police a favor. Following this, he gives a full confession to the murder of both Megan and Johnny. He talks about why he killed them. He comes out with that BS story that, oh, they tried to rob me. I got in my building, and that's when Johnny pulled a knife out, mm -hmm. and you shot. I shot. They saw a guy who had a load of money, drive mm -hmm. a car they can't afford, mm -hmm. they didn't have a car, and they were going to get something. So then you shot him how many times? Shot him twice. Okay. In the chest. Okay. Following this, Todd then goes into the details on the murder of Charlie Carver and the abduction of Kayla. But Todd was not done confessing there, was he? Oh no, because he had one last confession that would truly shock the detectives. Because Todd confessed that he was the person that carried out the mass shooting in the Superbike shop. So you pulled out the Beretta and what happened? Um... Shot the mechanic twice. 
They had heard the gunshots in the back and were coming this way to figure out what had happened. I had three people in front of me. I dropped the nearest. That was one big building. I cleared it in under 30 seconds. You what now? I cleared that building in under 30 seconds. You guys would have been proud. I'm sorry, but you guys would have been proud. Now this had been a cold case for nearly 13 years and the detectives are sat there and they are in complete shock because they knew that they had a serial killer on their hands. But now Todd is confessing to a mass murder and the way that Todd confessed to this murder, the way he chillingly went into all of the detail about each victim, how he shot them. And they knew that Todd was telling the truth about this because Todd was able to give the detectives details that were not released to the public. Todd was also trying to justify all of the murders by saying that the people that he killed, they were bad people. And it's like, really Todd, who the hell made you judge, jury and executioner? Why does he think that he is better than anybody else? And I don't know if you've noticed a pattern about Todd, but he seems to blame the victim. Every victim, it's always their fault. In the superbike murders, he blamed the victims by saying that they were bad people, they provoked him, they made fun of him, they wouldn't exchange his bike, they stole his bike. Then we get to Megan and Johnny, they tried to rob him. He also said that they were bad people because they took drugs. Then we take Charlie and Kayla, again with the same story, they tried to rob me. All the time he is trying to push the blame onto others, never taking responsibility for his own actions and that is a true narcissist. He is confessing to everything. He is being very open about what he is doing. But basically what he is saying is, oh yeah, I did all of this. I did all of these murders, but these people deserved it. It wasn't that bad. They brought it on themselves. And if that is not a narcissist, I don't know what is. And in the interview, Todd is kind of like laughing and joking with the detectives. He's almost trying to impress the detectives. Johnny had to pull the knife. Mm -hmm. If you'd seen the knife, you'd laugh your ass off. Really? Oh, God. You buy at the little convenience store? Are you serious? <laughs> I'm going, my ammo costs more than your, your damn knife. Are you kidding me? <clears throat> you're, costing, you're costing me money. But you're going to stab me. At least stab me with a butt knife or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to impress the detectives. He wants the respect of the detectives to feed his own ego. And the detectives interviewing Todd are kind of playing into that a little bit. It's something that they have to do, isn't it? They have to kind of play into these people like Todd to try and get the information out of them that they need. And following this interview, Todd was charged with seven counts of murder, two counts of kidnapping, and one count of criminal assault. And in the end, Todd wanted to avoid the death penalty. So he made a deal where he would plead guilty in exchange for seven life sentences without the possibility of parole. But if you thought that this story was over, you would be wrong. Following Todd's confessions, the story broke in the media and people were so shocked and angry. And it was at this point after the news broke that Todd's Amazon account and all of his reviews came to light, which then the media took that and started calling Todd the Amazon review killer. In the aftermath of his crimes, one more strange fact came out and that is the two male victims of Todd who were Johnny and Charlie, both of their bodies were found without feet. When their bodies were dug up, their feet were missing. Now detectives have questioned Todd about this and when he was questioned, he just completely clammed up and wanted to talk about a different subject and the feet of the victims have never been found. And we have no idea why Todd removed the feet but only off of the male victims. The way that the feet were removed as well, there is no way that that could have been done by an animal. And this has obviously led to a lot of speculation. He actually said a very chilling comment one time when he was confronted about this. And he said that he doesn't play with his food. And I really don't know what that means. But we don't know why he removed the feet, but I feel like it has to mean something that he only removed the feet off of the male victims. 
items that has to mean something. And finally, there is one more twist to this story, and that is that Todd has confessed to two more murders. He has said that there are more bodies out there. Todd has claimed responsibility for murdering two people before the superbike mass murder. He said that when he was living in an apartment complex, people found out that he was a sex offender and he was being harassed and bullied. And one night when he was in the parking lot of the apartment complex, two people came up to him and started to attack him, to which Todd then pulled out a knife and killed both of them. Now, the bodies of these victims have never been found. The police have looked into this and also no people were reported missing at around the same time that Todd claims to have killed these two people. But again, it kind of fits with his MO. He's blaming the victim. He says that these two people harassed him, attacked him. Now, there are some people out there that believe that he is responsible for more murders, including those two that he has confessed to. And then there are some people that think that he's just making all of this stuff up. He's just looking for more attention. He loves attention. And I can definitely agree with that. He loves attention. He will not stop talking. But Todd obviously has said that he has over a hundred victims, which I do not believe for one second. But with someone like Todd, I do believe that there could be more victims out there. I mean, he's gone from a rape at 15 years old. He then committed a mass shooting. He then abducts couples and kills them. That is a huge range. His MO is changing all of the time. And there is a really good documentary on this case that does kind of dive deeper into Todd and what more he could be responsible for. And also those two murders that he did confess to, but the bodies haven't been found. The documentary is called The Devil Unchained so definitely check that out if you want to know more about all of this. And that was the case of Todd Colhep and I just couldn't believe how many layers there were to this story. And what motivated Todd? Like, what motivated him? I definitely think that he is power motivated. He's also clearly sexually motivated as well. And I think it's very unusual that Todd actually targeted couples, which that in itself doesn't happen very often because two people, there's obviously more of a chance that they're going to get away. It's going to be harder to control the situation. But Todd thinks that he is above everyone. He likes to show his superiority. I also think that it's very telling that he always kept the female victim for longer. I definitely think that the women that he abducted he wanted them to fall in love with him. Also, Todd has only ever expressed regret over his female victims. He regrets the rape victim in the beginning. He regrets killing Beverly Guy in the superbike shooting. And he also regrets killing Megan and what he did to Kayla. But he doesn't regret killing any of the men. And I think that that is also very telling. I think this supports the theory that he was driven by trying to find a partner and he couldn't take it when they said no. And this all stems back, it all links back to the very first rape victim who turned him down multiple times. But finally, I want to end this case focusing on the many victims of today's case. And there are so many. Scott Ponder had a successful business in superbike motorsports. He worked there surrounded by loving friends and family. And he was happily married to the woman he loved. And at the time of his murder, his wife was pregnant with their first child, who sadly, Scott would never be able to meet. He was only 30 years old. Beverly Guy was the mother of Scott Ponder. She loved spending time with her family. She loved working in the shop with her son. She had a loving husband and she was incredibly excited about becoming a grandma. She also would never meet her grandchild. She was only 52 years old. Brian Lucas was described as a hard working man. He would do anything for anyone. He loved motorbikes. He loved working at the shop and he leaves behind a wife and two sons. He was only 29 years old. Chris Sherbert was described by his aunt as being the sweetest kid who loved fixing anything with a motor and was always tinkering with something all of the time. He was currently in a happy relationship and he had his whole life ahead of him. He was only 26 years old. Johnny Coxey was described by his mom as an adventurous and happy child who loved spending time out in the yard riding his dirt bike. He later went on to meet his loving wife, Megan, and the two of them had a bright future ahead of them raising their child together. 
He was only 29 years old. Megan Coxie was described by her family as a happy young girl who loved spending time with her family. And she was looking forward to her future with Johnny and their child. She was only 26 years old. Charlie Carver was described as a loving son who loved to write, had a passion for life and loved spending time with his family. They described him as the best person you could ever meet and a hero that was taken from them in the wrong way. He was only 32 years old. And finally, we have Kayla Brown, who was abducted and suffered through the most horrendous things at the hands of Todd. She has to live with what Todd did to her, what she witnessed. She has to live with that every single day. And I just hope that Kayla is doing okay. We also have the first victim of Todd, who was the rape victim in the beginning, and her life was completely changed by what Todd did to her. But it's not just the people that were murdered by Todd, it's all of the friends and the family. And I just, I hate it when, um, sorry. I hate that there are so many kids that have to grow up now without a parent. And I just hope that all of those children are doing okay. And I also hope that Scott's wife, who was accused of killing her own husband, I hope that she's doing okay. I hope everyone is doing okay. And whether we will actually ever know what was really going on in Todd's head, I don't know, but I will say that Todd likes to talk, so who knows. As always, let me know your thoughts, theories, and opinions, and don't forget to leave me your case suggestions because I always want to know what you want to hear next. Thank you again to Magellan for sponsoring today's video. Don't forget you can get your free 30-day trial by visiting the link in my description box. And that is everything from me. I hope you all have a good week ahead, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.